You're listening to Conferences Online Allergy from Children's Mercy Hospitals and Clinics in Kansas City, Missouri. Today is October 17, 2011, and I'm your host, Dr. Jay Portnoy. Our topic today, asthma, pathogenesis, and new treatments. Our presenter is Joshua Burkhart. He's a fourth-year medical student at the University of Missouri, Kansas City School of Medicine. review of asthma pathogenesis. Um, the manifestations of an asthma reaction are reversible airway obstruction, chronic bronchial inflammation, uh, smooth muscle hypertrophy, hyperreactivity, and mucus secretion. Approximately 70% of asthma cases are uh, atopic and they're IgE mediated. Um, and it's an inflammatory condition uh, that's caused by an immediate hypersensitivity and then a, there's a late phase reaction later on. Um, and these Repeated exposures um, are due to a trigger. Usually there's a trigger in asthma. Um, and they can lead to subepithelial fibrosis. Um, so right here I want to talk about Th2 cells. Th2 cells set up the whole stage for asthma uh, and atopy in general. Um, so I, Th2 cells uh, secrete IL-4, IL-5, and IL-13. And those help class switch uh, the B cells to B cells to IgE um, and recruit eosinophils. Um, so uh, this this will be important later on. Th2 cells secrete IL-13, and then uh, we're going to talk about mast cells. Uh, we're going to just jump to the mast cells instead of how the mast cells get activated, because um, that's really the pathogenesis of of asthma. So mast cells release and form mediators due to cross-linking of antibodies uh, to an antigen response. Um, the mediators are either released immediately or they're, um, or they're formed. And the, the mediators that are released immediately are the histamines uh, or the biogenic amines and the enzymes. Uh, the mediators that are synthesized are your uh, lipid mediators that come from arachidonic acid, like your prostaglandins, your leukotrienes. And then there's also cytokines that are synthesized. And uh, mast cells also produce IL-4, 5, and IL-13. Um, so uh, now let's go down to the, um, the uh, molecules themselves. The biogenic amines, uh, what they do in asthma, they contribute to bronchial constriction. The enzymes, uh, the tryptase in general causes tissue damage. Uh, and the chymase can help in uh, mucus secretion. They break down the basement membrane, which uh, stimulates mucus secretion. Uh, a thing of note is the tryptase is found only in mast cells, and that is a marker of anaphylaxis. Um, lipid mediators, the leukotrienes, um, they help attract neutrophils and eosinophils, but uh, they're also involved in bronchial constriction. Um, and this is part of the late phase reaction. Cytokines are involved in chemotaxis and contribute to late phase and fibrosis. Uh, and the fibrosis is what I want to talk about next. So uh, I looked up some articles about fibrosis. Um, and, and here's what I found about subepithelial fibrosis is that in mice, Th2 cells are indicated in fibrosis. Um, they're, they're related. Um, and these cells secrete cytokines IL-4, 5, and IL-13. And they found that. Uh, IL-13 especially was found uh, to be associated with the fibrosis. Um, and TGF-beta and IL-13 uh, induce fibroblasts to, to produce periostin in mice. And periostin is something I couldn't find any information about except in uh, research. I couldn't find it in, in uh, any books. Um, so eosinophils, eosinophils are recruited uh, to the site of inflammation um, by mediators and uh, cytokines. Um, and some of those recruiters are eataxin and periostin. Um, eosinophils are 
part of the late phase reaction, they release major basic protein and eosinophil cation or protein. And these proteins are toxic to cells, which uh, contributes more to the fibrosis. So periostin, um, specifically, has been shown uh, to recruit the eosinophils to the lungs and other mucosal surfaces, um, uh, like the esophagus. So how it works is it uh, allows the eosinophils to bind to fibronectin. And then that's how the eosinophils come to the site, is by binding to this fibronectin. Uh, eotaxin works in a similar manner. Uh, knockout mice for periostin in this study <coughs> here done by uh, Blanchard and others um, shows that without periostin, the, my, the knockout mice could not recruit eosinophils to the lungs or the esophagus. And IL-13, they found, was the cytokine responsible for the in inducing the periostin production. It was uh, formally believed that it was TGF-beta that was the one that uh, recruited, and that was through IL-13. But um, they found that IL-13 itself, uh, without TGF-beta, um, brought or uh, was responsible for the chemotaxis. And IL-13, this is important, is produced by TH2 cells mast cells and eosinophils. So instead of uh, targeting a cell, a certain cell, for uh, treatment in asthma, it's easier to target one molecule since they all secrete the same molecule. And so here's our uh, new treatment that it's a potential. It's an IL-13 inhibitor. It's levocizumab. It's a monoclonal antibody against IL-13. Um, and there was a randomized double-blind placebo controlled study that was published. Um, and the study involved only adults that were poorly controlled, uh, moderate to severe, in asthma on inhaled corticosteroid therapy. Uh, 106 patients, they put in a leverkizumab group, 112 in a placebo group. Um, they got a baseline periostin on each subject, and then the patients were followed for 32 weeks. A uh, pre-bronchodilator, FUB1, was measured as the primary outcome, and an exploratory outcome measure was uh, exhaled nitric oxide. So the results, a 5.5 difference was reported between the two groups, um, not including periostin. But when you uh, subgroup <clears throat> between high periostin and low periostin, so basically these would be like the knockout mice and normal mice, uh, in the high periostin subgroup, the FEV1, um, there's a difference of 8.2 in the leverkizumab group uh, compared to the placebo group. And in the low periostin subgroup, the difference was 1.6%. And that was uh, significant between the high periostin and low periostin. Um, the FEV1 changed more drastically in the high periostin subgroup with this treatment. And so the exploratory outcome uh, exhaled nitric oxide, a 19% decline in FENO was found in the leverkizumab group, and a 10% increase was found in the placebo group. This makes sense uh, if you think about uh, nitric oxide being a marker of eosinophilic inflammation, and an IL-13 inhibitor would decrease um, eosinophil infiltration. So this makes sense. So what, it, what does this mean? It means the asthma treatment will likely become more individualized. There's another uh, study that Dr. Chacho gave me about a glucocorticoid-induced transcript 1 gene and a response to steroids. Um, and this study found that the FEV1 in individuals with the mutant allele had a 66% less response than those that had the wild type. So even in corticosteroid, treatment, those that are having moderate to severe asthma, we can maybe do a, a study on them to look at their genes and see if they would respond to glucocorticoids or not. So basically, whatever the future holds, an exciting time. It's an exciting time in the world of asthma treatment. There's going to be lots of new treatments, I'm assuming. And in my research, I found lots of other different molecules that could potentially be targeted. Uh, it's just so many things. I mean, mast cells secrete so many different molecules. But that's 
what I have for you today. This has been an ACAAI production. To learn more about Conferences Online Allergy or the American College of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology, go to www.acaai.org. See you next time.